Good evening. My name is Alessandra Moctezuma, and I'm the gallery director and professor of museum studies here at San Diego Mesa College. And thank you so much for joining us this evening for an interesting uh, uh, talk with a lecture by the artist in our uh, show, Encoded Histories. Um, in putting together this exhibition, in, in curating it and thinking of um, the pairing of the two artists, um, I was really struck by the connections that existed between the two, both of them painters, although very different type of painters, and also both of them dealing with a lot of the issues that are going on in the Middle, in the middle East. Um, I saw Doris Vitar's work probably it was like maybe 10 years ago, or yeah, about 10, maybe 10 years ago at David Zapp Gallery uh, in Little Italy. And I was really struck by um, the intensity and delicacy of her paintings. I, I love the layering of the patterns. And um, I kind of followed her. And uh, at some point, we met when she opened uh, a gallery in North Park, Prutea Gallery. And, and that's when we finally kind of made the connection. But I, I had been looking at your work for years and, and just really admiring and thinking about that it was something that I wanted to bring uh, for our students to see. Um, and, and Doris' uh, work that you see in the gallery, this, the, um, the flag paintings, is something that she started after 9/11, and subsequently after that event, there were, um, you know, inter the um, invasions of uh, Iraq and then Afghanistan, and then since then we've also had, you know, our Arab Spring, uh, and now again we have a lot of issues going on with ISIL. So the Middle East has been in constantly in our minds, but how many exhibits have you seen? Where, an, where artists deal with that topic. Um, also about five years ago, I think it was, Kais um, sent me some materials. Uh, he had immigrated uh, to the US and he wanted to introduce himself and show me some of his work. And he, he came to the gallery with uh, catalogs and I was immediately struck by the beauty and expression in his paintings. Uh, but then I also looked into some of his conceptual work and the stories that he was telling about his experience as an artist in Baghdad, um, you know, having a life and, and being, um, you know, at a university and being an artist and suddenly everything is taken from you. And, uh, and then coming to a new country and having to start a new life here. And, and I think that is presented very well in the pieces that we showed in the gallery. So I wanted to bring these two artists together. I wanted to bring Doris and Kais um, for our students to see also the universal value of art, that both of them are speaking, uh, trying to establish a dialogue. With Doris, she's talking about um, the layering of the symbolism that comes from the two cultures, and she's, but she's also wanting us to see the beauty you know, um, in, in her, uh, like I, I, I think of her black, um, her scratchboard paintings. Um, and, and also with Kais, you know, connecting with us and, and trying to, to make us understand what it was like. And so I think it, it turned out to be a beautiful exhibit and, and I hope you come back and, and you invite your friends. Uh, but I think the best part of this evening is, is to hear the artists tell us about their work and also to open it up for the for you for the students for our guests uh, to ask them questions about some of the pieces that are in the show I know I have some questions for them too um, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail or, or like read their bias but I do want to tell you that that both Kais and Doris are artists that show that, that work all the time you know they're passionate about what they do and they've shown their work internationally and, and, their, and their work is in, in collections all over the world. Just recently, um, uh, Doris Vitar had a show at the uh, San Diego Museum of Art. She shot, wore an industry exhibition last, uh, last year. Um, so I'm just going to let the artists speak for themselves and speak about their, their, their works in more detail. 
Um, I just wanted to also um, let you know that besides being the gallery director, I'm bringing artists to our galleries for our students to experience. I also teach a museum studies uh, class. And so everything that you see in the gallery, the gallery is a laboratory for students to actually learn how to put together an exhibition, how to do the lighting, how to understand what's behind it and trying to express it um, you know, through labels, through you know, other ways of, of, of presenting this information, marketing. Uh, my advanced class is um, also a uh, great way to learn about curating. Uh, this year they're doing a curatorial project at the um, San Diego Art Fair in November and so we're collaborating with the San Diego Art Institute and the students have selected artists for that show and then my students go on to do an internship at a museum or gallery and so we're one of the few colleges that offer this type of program and it really prepares the students for careers and in the art world. Uh, many of them go from here to actually get jobs in, in some of the museums or have that connection when they go on to uh, pursue their um, their undergraduate and graduate degrees at other places. So, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's very unique and I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about it. So I want to thank also my staff, Pat Vine and um, Jackie and Arissa and Sharon and then I have a student intern share and, and they help us make this happen. Uh, most galleries would have a big staff. I'm, I'm, Pat and I are, are, are the only college staff and, and the rest are, are students and, and other volunteers that help us. Okay, so without any further ado, we're going to have Doris Vitar talk to us about her work. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, thanks so much, Alessandra. It's just been a real pleasure and uh, I just... Uh, she, I, I want to thank her for two things in particular, for bringing Kais and I together. I, um, did everyone hear me? Sorry, I want to thank Alessandra for two things in particular, many more than two, but just two that I'll mention right now. First of all, for bringing Kais and I together, I did not know about his work. I didn't know he was in San Diego, and you know, she did the legwork to, to bring us. And then the other thing, um, just her courage to show two Arab artists. I mean, it's just sort of unprecedented and um, in a you know, major exhibit. Uh, basically, uh, the Iraqi consulate from Los Angeles came down here <laughs> for this show. They were so thrilled because, uh, in a way, Kais and I are ambassadors for our culture and the diversity of our culture. Now, I was born in, in Baghdad as was Kais, but I'm not Iraqi. Ethnically, I'm Lebanese and Palestinian. And uh, people don't really understand. I think it influenced me, because I have more affinity with Iraqi artists than most other artists. And the artists are different in different cities. In Beirut, they're very conceptually grounded. And in, in Palestine, they kind of combine traditions with other sorts of traditions. In Syria, there's a kind of modernism that continues, which is interesting. It's not retrograde, it's just interesting that they do that. And in Iraq, it was always the large cultures brought together, the larger architectural, engineering, traditional arts. And the arts in Iraq in, in, uh, flourished despite the repressions of the regime. The visual arts were allowed quite a bit of leeway, even protesting things that the government uh, was doing, and without harm, not too much anyway. <laughs> But people are surprised by that, you know, that there's, the regions and the cities are all different from each other. Anyway, um, my work is really grounded in um, studying and researching history and layering it or, let's say, telling a story, a history or a personal story, and using pattern as a lattice, as a structure. So I don't see pattern as just merely fill-in. I see it as a structural way, you know, can it, what if you make the pattern bigger? What happens? You know, what happens to all the other sorts of components? Can pattern be important? Um, I see pattern, I, I'm kind of a pattern archivist. I collect patterns from around the world. And uh, I see pattern as a sort of cultural DNA. And, uh, and I examine it as such, and like taking a double helix and blowing it up and making a huge sculpture out of it, and what, what will happen you know, if I, we tell, try to tell a story out of that. So I see pattern that way as, as a kind of cultural DNA. 
Um, and I dream in patterns, I'm obsessed with them. I do little scratch board black and white pieces out there I do before I go to sleep. They're like my little bedtime story. And I imagine all kinds of things when I'm doing them. And then I read a lot about history. I love poetry of all cultures and uh, it all influences me. So uh, although my, my background is primarily painting, um, I've expanded to photography and uh, some, um, even a musical piece. And I just wanted to show you the video that's on my website, just briefly. It's just like a minute long. So this was a, a piece uh, I did in Ravenna to honor the Byzantine heritage of Ravenna and how it influenced Arab art. The, these are 1,100 bars of soap from Lebanon that were imported to Italy. And that was, that was the whole story by itself. But, um, <laughs> but it's just a sampling of my work. The first thing is the musical instrument I created. Not too much. This is a word piece I did with Diane, poet, local poet Diane Gage. Baghdadi Bride, which is in the show, um, takes the Jasper Johns flag of the 48 stars, which was a conceptual piece he did, but I see it as steeped in nostalgia. <laughs> and there's the soap. This is a piece I did in Sharjah, in the United Arab Emirates, about pearl divers. My interest was in labor, pearl divers as laborers. <laughs> this is a more personal uh, painting from the, um, from the Lebanese linen series and the people of the book, a very large piece. It's flat, but it looks three-dimensional. And uh, maps made out of security envelope patterns. Map of the Arab world made out of security envelope patterns. I was collecting for years. I didn't know what to do with them. And then suddenly I made flags out of them and then maps. And <laughs> Made sense, you know. Um, anyway, um, so since 9-11, I've been really obsessed. I've been doing several projects at once. I mean, most of the work you've, you've seen right now and in the show is since 9-11. Um, but I was kind of, you know, when 9-11 when occurred, uh, as an Arab American, I was sort of hallucinating. I was seeing images of the American flag and Middle Eastern patterns. Um, while I was awake, I was seeing them, little flashes of them. Sometimes they didn't go away. I was sort of swimming in it. And uh, I uh, said, I guess that's what I'm going to have to paint. <laughs> you know? I was about to embark on another project. I won't tell you about that. Maybe one day in my 90s I'll get to it. But, you know, I mean, that's the thing, is I wonder sometimes what kind of artist I would be if it weren't for all this stuff that keeps happening, you know, that I need to respond to. Um, I'll back up a little bit. Since my early 20s, I've been an activist. Did not relate my artwork necessarily to my activism. Since I was about 22, I, was, uh, I started out as a labor organizer for almost five years, um, working with uh, women and immigrants back in Connecticut. And uh, after that, peace activist with my husband, who's here, and you know, Nevada test site stuff when we moved out here. Yes, we've been arrested. <laughs> we didn't do anything bad, we just trespassed and stopped traffic occasionally in New Haven, Connecticut. But. Um, uh, so, you know, then we had a family here and uh, continued uh, with uh, our, our efforts towards peace and civil rights. Uh, I'm currently president of the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee chapter in San Diego. And uh, then also my husband and I, for five, six years, worked on Jewish-Palestinian dialogue. Now, the whole time, I would do my artwork as a kind of historical research and separate from my activism. Um, and it seems more like the two are in, less separable than they used to be. Um, you know, maybe the last few years or maybe since 9-11. Um, and uh, 
let me get back a little bit to this uh, hallucinating the flag and Middle Eastern patterns because this show gives me an opportunity to reflect on a, a work that I've been doing since 2001 with the flags. And I thought I was done 2011. And then uh, my father died um, around that same period and I began to hallucinate that he was still here near me. And I looked into it. I'm, I, I could probably get a master's degree in psychology. I researched that a lot too. And apparently it's very common to hallucinate if you're grieving. So then I went back to 2001 and I realized that's what I was doing. I was grieving, but I couldn't grieve. Like a lot of Amer Arab Americans, we were too busy defending ourselves against an avalanche of ignorance and hatred from my own friends, from all kinds of factors, even within our community, a kind of denial of being an Arab um, because you're putting yourself out there. So I see these pieces as a kind of prolonged sort of trying to understand that, but in a, in, at least on a psychological level, as an experience of, of grieving, a, a lot of things, you know, a lot of, you know, because it's, it's always in the news. <laughs> I think I'd be a minimalist pattern painter if I, <laughs> if it wasn't always in the news, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Or, I don't know, a stand-up comic or something. I mean, not, not this, but, you know, it's like I'm always trying to, like, get out from under and, and, and help people understand about looking at this with fresh eyes and understanding it in a different way. And I think with that, I'll just maybe start taking questions. Um, something else I'm working on is uh, the, uh, with other artists in San Diego and throughout the United States, we've created uh, a group called Gulf Labor West. And we have an exhibit called Labor Migrant Gulf that I've been involved with. So um, about the uh, spe speaking out as artists for the laborers in the Arabian Persian Gulf who come largely from India and other places in Asia and are being exploited to create these like stadiums in Qatar and uh, buildings in uh, cultural institutions in Abu Dhabi. And Gulf Labor, based in New York, um, began to uh, discuss uh, boycotting the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi and the Louvre. And we've made quite a name for ourselves. We've gotten a lot of press from The Guardian, The New York Times, all kinds of things. And San Diego created its own faction. And our mission here is to link that gulf to our Gulf of Mexico, another labor pool. And so after all these years, I'm doing labor and art sorts of things again, which I uh, uh, I'm really pleased about. My, my labor experiences were as, as powerful, almost as powerful as having children. Both had me to do with labor. And, and ending in the middle of the night, usually. All of them. Except <laughs> Gabriel, you were born in the afternoon. <laughs> the other one was one in the morning and labor contract, like 2.30 a.m., you know, that kind of... <laughs> Um, but I think I'll just open it up to questions, and I'll, I'll try to answer your questions as best as possible. So, yes? Uh, so, have, being of Eric descent, have you found that like you're kind of discriminated against like, with some of your art? Like they don't take it as seriously, or they just like don't want to see it because of the questions or ideas you're trying to express? You, you know, I haven't experienced too much uh, discrimination, but as an Arab artist, not a single museum of contemporary art has shown an Arab artist in this entire country. And now MoMA has Museum of Modern Art. Um, I think the Museum of, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has, the Guggenheim has, even though we're beating up on them now about the labor stuff in, in the Gulf. But, um, but those are all based in New York, and the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Massachusetts has. They showed Mona Hatoum's work, an amazing artist, Palestinian artist, who's, you know, she's going to be remembered 100 years from now. <laughs> and they're not showing her in any of the Museum of Contemporary Arts in the United States, except for the Massachusetts one, which isn't affiliated to a city, it's a state museum. And uh, I've complained about this to our local Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, you know, I, I don't really understand it because, as you can see, the work is very layered, complex, 
nobody's pointing a finger. It's just trying to understand and express, you know, kind of what we've been going through and the complexity of the region and, uh, you know, the implicit and explicit, you know, role the United States and Europe has had over the years and, you know, those sort of issues. I mean, it's about a conversation, you know. It's about having a conversation. It's not work that is attacking anyone. So I don't understand that, but, you know, that has been a problem. Um, I haven't really faced too much discrimination, though. You know, maybe as a woman, like any woman would anywhere, you know, in a, you still get discriminated against just being a girl, you know. Yeah? Uh, can that piece that's uh, presently uh, being depicted be expanded so we can see it? As, is it meant as a mosaic? Yeah, I could show you. Um, can, you make, can you enlarge it? Yeah, I can go to the, the art part. Which is, yeah, if you go to the, I just, you know, sometimes people get bored showing too much of this sort of thing. But if you go to my site and you go to installations, you could see longer elaborations on all of these. But, you know, I don't, oops, not that one, right? That's a different one. Um, I know there's one here for the soap story. It's called Soap Story. It's a, it's a big Greco-Roman braid to thank the city of Ravenna for the Byzantine patterns that they gave the Arab world, the Middle Eastern world, or the Islamic world. I don't like saying Islamic world because it was really a lot of people. It was Islamic administrators, but it was um, all kinds of people. You know, we don't say Christian art, but we could. We don't feel comfortable saying Christian art, even though it was all Christian art. <laughs> but in, these, in the Arab world, in the Middle East, in this, it wasn't all Islamic art. It was Islamic administrators, but it was Christians, Muslims, Jews, uh, Italians, Africans, Chinese. It was a real broad mix of people, which, by the way, is the way our country is here. We mix it all up, you know. And, uh, Uh, from Lebanon, actually. Lebanon? Yeah, from Tripoli in northern Lebanon. Doris, I have a question for you. Sure. Based on your experience, how did you find that this sort of uh, cultural exchange of constructed bridges between our different cultures, how this uh, gap between our cultures is decreased uh, because of those uh, artistic activities? How, how, how do you think that this cultural ex, uh, exchange is very useful through these uh, art events? Um, do you mean um, the kind of show we're having now? Yes. Or yes. how is it useful? So Kais is asking, how is having an exhibit like this useful? Um, well, I was selfishly talking about how I learned a little bit more about myself and how I could speak maybe more personally about the pieces. But I think... You know, like I said, it's like we're at, we act as diplomats, and uh, it's a Middle Eastern trait to be a negotiator. Mm -hmm. I know it doesn't. I know that's not what it looks like right now, right? But um, we're very good at negotiating various spaces, mixing things together. That's what a Middle Eastern culture is. It's a mix of stuff from all kinds of influences, Africa you know, Byzantine, you know, uh, culture, gypsy culture, ancient history that's there. It's a mix of stuff. We're very good at it. And we're very good at getting along with each other, historically. We don't marry each other, that's, that's forbidden, but we work together and we create culture together and business together and share, you know, with each other. So, um, you know, in a way that's what the United States is, except people can marry each other here more easily. You just you just can't really do that there. It's not that it doesn't happen, but you know your family really gets on your case if you don't do exactly what they want you to do. Who to marry? What to major in in college? For men and women, parents are very oppressive in the Middle East in that regard. Mom and dad, right? <laughs> and Kais and I are both mavericks. I'm sure you weren't encouraged to be an artist. Maybe you were. I I certainly wasn't. No. 
But, you know, and I certainly wasn't encouraged to be a labor organizer. In fact, I was organizing, <laughs> I was organizing this really historic union drive right when my father, who was in corporate New York, was firing labor organizers in his business. Wow. And, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, it's okay, I, I love my dad, but, you know, <laughs> that's just, I, was, I did all kinds of things like that, that kind of went against, my parents were very conservative, Republican, I could say worse things, and, uh, but I won't, and, uh, you know, I, I, my husband is Jewish, liberal, Jewish, Democrat type, you know, and uh, so it was a little bit, you know, it was fine with them, I mean, I wasn't rejected or anything. But I'm kind of, I mean, I couldn't help who I was going to fall in love with, so, you know, or what I was going to do, or that I was going to care about working people, or <laughs> any of that stuff. So, um, but anyway, I don't know if that answers yeah. your question. Any, any other questions? Yes? Um, in regards to your answer right now about how, I'm, I'm Lebanese, and my parents are also very conservative and strict, especially... Very fashionable, though. Um, yes, yes. Not, um, yeah, like not prudish, like. But I just wanted to get your opinion on why you think that is that way. For instance, my mother said, oh, you need to be a doctor, you only can be marry someone that's like me. You know, all parents do that, I mean, it seems. Uh, American parents less likely. Um, but but the Arab parents are just worse. They're just they really get their way too. The kids. I mean, how many engineers, you know, go become engineers? They have, I mean, our Army Corps of Engineers in this country is made up 85 percent of Lebanese, Palestinian, and Iranian people who are immigrants. Our, when you hear about the Army Corps of Engineers, it's like the enemy. <laughs> You know, are making sure our bridges are safe and the streets, are free, everything's okay. <laughs> so you know, you, but but anyway, not not because we can't be trusted, but I mean because we did what our parents told us to do. So you just have to ignore them and do what you want. There was an engineer who really all he wanted to do was play the piano at at, at Chartres in Paris in France, not in Chartres, and. And one day he walked in there and he started playing their piano, and they said, that's it, you got the job. And he quit his engineering job, and the, the pianist at Chart is Lebanese, with an engineering degree. I'm not kidding. Well, Thais has an engineer, you've got an engineer. Yeah, there you go. Bad, you didn't stick with your job. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the process in surveying the various patterns, trying to discern the meaning, like the iconographic meaning, what and how how something might be used in a pattern, how it might be used or co-opted, or just talk to a little bit about. Well, see, when you look at when you look at the patterns of cultures, you see a lot of overlap, and if you follow the history, like the, the you know Islamic art. Okay, for lack of a better word, Middle Eastern art is very distinct looking. You see it, and everybody knows it's Arab or Persian or you know Middle Eastern. But it came from Byzantine patterns that look very Islamic. If you go to San Marcos in Venice and you look at the floor, it's an entire mosaic of all the various patterns there are. So what the Arabs did. And the Arabs did do it before the Persians. The Persians ended that whole thing very, very wonderfully and at a very high level. But what the Arabs did is they took those patterns, they mixed it with science, geometry, um, text, literature, and came up with this very new looking culture. You know, so I mean, it's really quite simple. And then if you think of how in, in Western Europe, how they were just marching towards this, uh, you know, realism was the big thing, and then after modernism it broke up and they were interested in abstraction, they went and they looked at Asia, the Arab world, for ideas to create abstraction, which, you know, turned into, you know, our contemporary art, and so it's a mix, but they did it much later. We did it, you know, the, the Arabs did it very, very early. Very early, and in, in, in terms of architecture, engineering, all kinds of um, disciplines, chemistry. math, chemistry. 
all kind of, and then that, that fed the European Renaissance. So it's been going on for a long time, and we're still good at that. I mean, you know, the Lebanese are very good at business, and because they're just where they're situated, and they're good at pulling from here and there and making things happen. And then Arabs in general, you know, engineering is very strong. The, the Egyptian engineers and what was going on in engineering and architecture in Iraq influenced, they brought those engineers to Los Angeles to help build the subway system here, which is based on the one in Cairo. That's recent history. So, you know, there's all these overlaps um, from China, patterns from China, and all kinds of stuff. Music was really, Western music was born in Byzantine Syria. You know, they, they took um, Gregorian chanting, which was Syrian, Christian, and mixed it with the gypsy rhythm and an African beat, and you got Arabic music, and that fed, that created the harmonic scale. You know, and to this day you hear Arabic music and it sounds like rock and roll a little bit. I mean, the beat and the, you know, so those things are just, uh, we, it's something we love to do. We love to mix. I'm not doing anything extraordinary, really. I feel like I'm just following my, my heritage. And then being an American, we're encouraged here to mix things up and get along. And diversity is better than homogeneity and, yeah. I perhaps the uh, prohibition against figurative art in parts of the Middle East and the... Well, that's really a kind of... Besides the patterns? And well, there was an interest in pattern, and the prohibition is kind of a myth. I mean, you, you, you'd almost have to say the whole world had a prohibition. It, what really is distinct is Europe's absolute obsession with realism. That's what's different. Because there's so many exceptions. In Judaism in the Middle East, in every culture, there's a lot of imagery. You know, you find so many exceptions. And then 300 years ago, some, you know, uh, religious leaders in Islam got together and said, that's such a silly thing, let's just not, let's just prohibit it in religious places, which Judaism does too. So, it's, it's just a myth, you know. It really is. There's actually a great book called My Name is Red by a Turkish oh, yeah. uh, author. I've read it. And, 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 yeah, so Pete in that Pamuk. sense it talks about that, that conflict that mm -hmm. existed and it wasn't so much that they couldn't do representational but that you know the Venetian painters were so obsessed with realism and it was... Yeah, and there was this kind of competition, competition. Yeah, and jealousy almost across the Adriatic between Italy and Turkey. <laughs> I mean it's just all much more interesting. Not, none of there's hardly anything you could say that's so like absolute, you know, about these things. Yes. Yeah, in talking about your your obsession with patterns, I noted that a lot of your work, the pattern is defined by the negative space, which is what where you where you put your efforts, especially like in your little scratch point works. The pattern is defined by to a large extent the negative space, and I was just wondering how that relates to your fetishism or whatever you would call it, your obsession with patterns. Well, I mean, having a strong negative space is just good training. I mean, that's what makes an art piece yeah, work, and one that doesn't work has a weak negative space. So, you know, so, I mean, and, and, and that interest was something, that figure, interest in figure ground was present in every culture in the world except for Europe. Now, it doesn't mean they didn't consider negative space, but not as extremely. Except since modernism and to now, now it's very important. Well, and yeah. Logo making is all about strong negative space, and that's only been something people have been interested in for 40 years. There weren't logos before. There wasn't that many fonts. There wasn't anything. Well, some of your work, I mean, it's obvious that you've, you've superimposed the pattern over the background, which may be the content or maybe not. But like I said, in, in, in others, I mean, the the lattice is literally, it's not there. Empty, it's, right. Yeah. It's, and, it's defined by what's behind it or around it. Or, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I, I do find that really appealing. I, I really like it. I'm just being a contemporary artist. I mean, no one, no contemporary artist worth their salt has weak negative space, right? That's right. When I, That's right. Yeah. When I teach my students, the, I, I teach intro to two-dimensional art, and the first thing I tell them is, what you're going to learn today, what you're going to learn this whole semester, and what's going to be emphasized throughout, is 
the ground is as important as the figure, and you want to mix them up. And this is a kind of a new thing, not for most of the world, but in terms of following European art or Western art, it's more of a new thing for us, you know, to make that background important. It's not that realistic still lives didn't have important backgrounds. They did, of course. But what defines modernism is to make the negative space important. What's not there is as important, maybe more important than what's there, right? I mean, if you look at that, the last the hundred years, 1850 to 1950, that's, and then things got more conceptual, you know, after the, you know, with Jasper Johns, after the drip paintings, things got, they changed, you know, that was kind of the beginning of modernism is like Eugene Delacroix, and it ends like with Jackson Pollock. It's like a hundred year period. I teach this song. <laughs> it's my opinion, I don't know, you know, it's, I, we could argue about it, but. But, it, but the Islamic world, the negative space was always very strong. As it was in African art, Mesoamerican art, Asian art, you know, Chinese art, Korean pottery, I mean, just Polynesian art, and that's been, that's been true for hundred year, hundreds of years. Yes? Hello. I was really touched by your comment about um, you know, comparing the morning you experienced the loss of your father with, you know, the advent of the war, you know. Well, I was puzzled. Why was I seeing the American flag? And I was wide awake. You can ask my husband. I was like, oh my God, it's like right in front of me, like waving all the day long. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, you know, and then the Islamic patterns or the Middle yeah, Eastern patterns. I was curious about that because I'm not, yeah, I was curious if you had that. Um, if you, if the Islamic patterns had been a part of your, of your aesthetics or everyday life, to where they would, they would kind of embark this kind of symbolism for you personally, you know, at the time of mourning. Yeah, I've been working with them for years, so and researching them constantly, and you know, using them in my other work. Before the flag, I never thought I'd be painting or depicting the flag. I mean, what? although it's an interesting flag, it's kind of a like a. It's a crazy flag, all those stripes, stars. It's a crazy flag, really. There's no other flag like it on the planet. It's the only flag that's so patterned. The other flags aren't patterned. One triangle, a circle, you know. Not like, what is it, 14 stripes and stars and 50 13. stars? 13, right? See, I'm a bad American. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, it's like, why couldn't we just have two stripes? Or, you know, why did... So I like that it, the flag, our American flag, is patterned. It's a patterned flag, and there is no other like it, unless you go to like you, you know, Samoa, which has the American flag too, but different stars. Or anyway, maybe I should hand it over to Kais, <laughs> then we can answer it together later. Does Thank that you. sound good? I Thank you. Oh yeah. A teeny little question um, about the stars on the flag. Does that have anything to do with the lattice? I mean, they're, they're shapes. They're There's a macro pattern. Yeah. But it changed. Uh, the 48 stars are in a grid, and then the 50 stars are offset, like a brick type of. And five-pointed and six-pointed stars have an ancient significance that relates to Judeo-Christian, you know. So I look at that, too, but. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. So next, next is Kais Alcindi. He's gonna talk to us about a little bit about his work. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. I am not good speaker as Doris is. She's a master here. Uh, I want to thank Alessandra and Doris for making this experience actual and on the ground. I, I like this experience uh, very much uh, to show our artwork together. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that uh, I'm basically an engineer. I graduated uh, from University of Baghdad College of Engineering Mechanical Department in, in 1989. And after engaging with their thermodynamics, heat transfer, metallurgy, strength of materials, and those stuff, and after I graduated and got the degree, 
I ask, my, I ask this question to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> because I know that I have a passion in art, I have to study the art from the beginning. And then I did a very vital and important decision in my life. I switched to be an artist. I studied four years to get the, the bachelor degree in fine art, and then I studied three years uh, to get the master degree in fine art, and my, uh, my thesis was, was about the Christian art. <laughs> and all, <laughs> and all the uh, churches, shrines, uh, monasteries uh, in Iraq. Uh, anyways, uh, for me, it's a little bit uh, weird to speak about my art as the, my art used to speak about me. But let's start here just to have like a short trip uh, through my art. Uh, in the beginning, I started to do, to do paintings. Um, from my childhood, I was doing paintings. And um, in the beginning, I started to do the realism style. And then I found myself in the abstract expressionism style. I feel that each painting has a tale because when I paint, I try to convey my stories and my tales. I interpret them to be an art piece. And then I demand or ask the audience or the viewer to make the reverse interpretation to, make, uh, th to get their own stories. I have my own story to tell it through my painting and then the viewer will get his own story. And this way, I, I like consider the paintings to be like mirrors. Everybody reflect his own experience, his own memories, his own passion, and everything. Uh, and and, and in my painting, there is a lot of layers because I, I paint many paintings at the same time. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when I called a, a client of mine and I told her I have an exhibition uh, this client purchased a painting from me uh, three years ago. And uh, she told me, Case, do you, do you know that I discovered there is a third woman in this painting? <laughs> uh, because the, the painting was under the title of woman, and she discovered there is another woman in the painting. And this is what I like. I like the joy of discovering new horizons and new things in my artwork. That means my artwork will not be blocked. And if it's blocked, there is no any joy in it. And then, after doing these uh, like series of artwork, I started to do many series of uh, love, peace, hope. Uh, I found that uh, the message of the paintings or the art in general is not just to decorate uh, the walls. There is another mission for the artworks is to say is uh, to convey a message, to, to tell something for the people. From here, uh, I started to do some murals. Um, these murals were uh, showed uh, in some colleges in Baghdad. This one is in the College of Fine Art in Baghdad, uh, about the Gornigan. Uh, the murals are more like uh, seasonable, that more people can see them, because not everybody goes uh, to the museums or galleries. Meanwhile, the murals can be displayed in the streets uh, and the squares. After the invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, my mind, I changed my mind and also I changed my attitude how to show my art. I told myself why I don't do something different. From this point, I thought to do video art and also to create installations and mixed medias. I started this uh, big installation, it's about uh, 2,000 uh, uh, pounds of uh, bookshelves. and. Uh, I brought this one to the gallery after I made my, my video art. I will show you now uh, the video art of this, the, this piece. Uh, the video art is uh, 11 minutes. It's showing uh, like a protest message against the burning of all the libraries and uh, bookstores in Iraq as a 
consequence of, uh, of the war that happened in 2003. Sorry. Here. This video art was one of about 15 artworks that I displayed in this exhibition, Letters Don't Burn. Uh, the exhibition took place in Amman, in Jordan. And it was uh, a sort of message of protest against the burning of uh, the, these libraries. Because when I, we returned, when we, the students of, uh, of the College of Fine Art, when you returned to the, to the campus, we saw that our library was destroyed. And there was not even one book remained. Every paper, every letter was burned. And I just wanted from this exhibition to tell why this happened at that time. The consequence of the war was more severe and miserable than the war itself. And uh, also I started, uh, how can I provoke the, 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 the viewers, the audience? Because when we go to, the, to, to any um, art show, we use just our eye, our vision. And then I try to use another sense of the human beings. Let's, okay, let's try the smell. How can I provoke the audience, the viewers, by the smell? I brought this uh, crude oil, uh, and I put it in this aquarium here, and some papers here. When the people came, the crowd came to the art show, the smell was very like severe, was very bad, and no, nobody can support it. And my message was that everything is happening on this globe is because of oil. And now we are detesting this smell. We are like, uh, don't like this smell, but the smell of this oil is the reason why all these conflicts and like uh, argument, arguments that happening in this world is happening right now. And also I put some, uh, some alwasati drawings to be drawn here in uh, this artwork. And also I kept doing more paintings. I created a series of love. Uh, at, the, at the same time that I like uh, against uh, the, the, the bad things that are happening in this globe, still I have uh, a hope and I still feel that I am uh, optimistic. In love, we can solve any problem that we have in our life. I did many, many paintings of love, of passion, and also struggle. The conceptual art, one of the pieces that uh, I show in this uh, exhibition is under the title of Mamdouh. Mamdouh, this guy here, he's a, a friend of mine. He's a specialist in portrait. When I was in Jordan, living in Jordan, uh, Mamdouh was attacked by a uh, booby-trapped car. A car exploded and he uh, injured and stayed in uh, the hospital for seven days and after seven days, he died. In this artwork, maybe I can go to my website uh, to show another picture here 
And here's the series of the painting. Um, I did four, four paintings for him. The, the first one is I depicted him in realism here, as you see. The second one is like I am showing or representing the time that he was injured in the hospital for seven days. And here, I painted this guy with the charcoal and the ruins of the same car that he was attacked, exactly. I asked uh, one of my friends to bring that charcoal that calls, like the ruins of that car, and I painted him with the, my charcoals, with, the, with my chalks, and with my pastel here. And I will ask the viewers to touch the third paintings. We know that it's prohibited or forbidden for everyone to touch any artwork in the museums. But here, no, I will, ask, I will ask you, no, please touch this painting. I want you to touch it. And when you touch it, you will get here stain on your, on your fingers. And then I provided the fourth piece, which is this one, which is a blank canvas. You need something to wipe your hand, to clean your hand. And with this canvas, you can wipe your hand. OK. And when you wipe your hand, you'll get a foot, uh, a fingerprints. And the fingerprints is a very important evidence that we are responsible for this crime. Everybody is responsible that there is no more peace in this world. We, we have to struggle, strive, work, fight for peace. And uh, when I did the first show in Switzerland, the line was about 400 people gathered and lined in this line to participate, to put their uh, fingerprints to say, yes, we are responsible for this. And uh, this piece is here in this, in this show. And this guy, this poor guy died, passed away, let's say assassinated in this crime. And uh, also I created more uh, videos about the immigrations and the people in exile and how they suffer and how they can be adapt with the new circumstances, with the new culture, with the new heritage, and also with the new people. Enjoyment? This is a mistake. I mean environment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, one of the, uh, of the topics and themes that I uh, try to, to analyze and uh, show in my artworks is the environment. Because uh, the problem of one of the main problems we have here, especially in California, is the drought, and uh, also missing or lacking of water. I showed uh, about uh, 100 or, or 122 of bottles of empty bottles of uh, wine here, and beside them there is a small, like 12 ounces of water. I am saying that this is small water is stronger and more powerful than those good-looking bottles here. And the message is we have to keep our water to maintain the sources of, of, of our water here. One also of uh, the conceptual uh, artwork here is this one that you maybe I don't know if you paid attention to it. We stick it on the ground as the footprint, uh, foothold, sorry. I am saying that uh, we uh, like compete uh, each other to find a spot for ourselves. We compete to get the positions, to get jobs. Uh, we compete uh, to take opportunities to get like better life. And this artwork, if you try to find a spot for your for your foothold, I doubt it that you can't find one. The competition the competition is very difficult. The idea is very contemporary. And I show here like mixes of uh, animals, children's, barefoots, uh, uh, civilians, uh, troops, everything you can find here. It took about uh, two weeks to design this one. And uh, thank you for Alessandra who helped me like to make this, uh, the, this artwork to be achieved and uh, sticked on the ground. <laughs> it was many obstacles that we faced to, to, to do this artwork. And also one of the installations, it was about the knowledge and culture uh, because of uh, the globalism that we are uh, living right now. 
it's really that we open a book. I am here the message that I ask the people to keep uh, the hard, co the, the, let's say, the hard copies of books, not just uh, everything is electronics. Um, also, this one uh, I displayed uh, this uh, this piece in one of my previous exhibitions and showed how these books were uh, screwed and tightened with a very long screws. And those two pieces, uh, they are in the show. They are nine by seven feet. Um, I am telling the story of the displaced people in my country uh, as a consequences of the invaders of the ISIS. When ISIS um, occupied uh, Mosul and some uh, cities in Iraq, uh, they ruined and distracted everything. And those displaced people, those exiled people, they don't have home, they don't have a place, they quit everything. And these expressionism style, I try to say that those, those people who displaced from their houses, they kept having their country or their home in their heart. And the cube, cube here is a symbol of the country, is a symbol of the house, is the symbol of the home. And that small two pieces that you see is the sketches that I prepared to, be, to do this large scale paintings. And at the end of the day, I, am st I see myself painter more than doing those installations because my passion, passion is always in art. I think that's it. It's very like a uh, uh, briefly short trip to my art. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be more happy to answer you. Yes. Going back to the piece with the bookshelf, um, in, and then the video piece you showed us after it, with it burning, was that the bookshelf that you had designed that, that was contained the books and the fire, or were they two separate pieces? The, the, the top section of the bookshelf was a cuneiform letter, which belonged to the Sumerian writing. And it was very tough to design this one and also to make it uh, to make it because it was metal. And after we like uh, shoot the film and uh, like finished everything, I transferred this bookshelf to the gallery. And the problem that we faced it was too big to get it in the gallery because the the gate was too small. We cut it two pieces and get it inside and we welded welded it and like attached the the two pieces. And also I make. Uh, some visual effects. I wrote some smokes and uh, I painted all the gallery in black, some black curtains just to put you like in a horror movie because what happened, happened at that time, it was very scary. Um, and it was like, you, ca you, you can see that when, when you see something in a movie, sometimes you feel that you want to see the location. You want to meet the actors. You want to see some accessories. And I brought that book sh uh, bookshelf there uh, bookcase there just to tell the people here here is it and it was uh, a good a good response I got and good feedback I got from the from the, the crowd of that time I, I really like the way that you had the woman that initially appears in the in the frame with the barn and all that, that she was oh, you could only see part of her it's a long it's a 11 minutes movie I just uh, displayed the last uh, couple minutes or last uh, last minute. It's a struggle between the good and the bad. The good, which was the girl, she's a very beautiful girl. She she's uh, representing here uh, the culture, our culture, and uh, that guy he is the like demon or uh, devil here. And the one of the sequences, there is a fight between them, a fight and the. And, 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 uh, and the shape of dance. They were dancing and fighting, and there is a music, and also uh, um, the camera moves uh, upward to, to, show, to show what they are doing. Uh, I just wanted to, to show the last minute because the last minute is more passionate and uh, is more powerful. Yes? Who actually, do you know, does anyone know who actually burned the libraries? This is a very good question, because what happened is just the libraries were burned. 
like uh, the, the classes, the labs, everything was okay. Uh, just, the, uh, just the libraries. And who did this is anonymous. I don't know. It's anonymous. Yeah. Yes? Uh, with your paintings, when you write your stories into them, do you find that you have more joy when people read the story or like interpret the story as you wrote it or when they come up with their own story? Well, what I used to do um, in each catalog or each uh, brochure that I uh, published with my exhibitions, unfortunately we, d we did not do this in these exhibitions. Um, anyways, in and, and my brochures, I, I, I used to write uh, a very, very short synopsis or statement about the artwork. Like, like let's say I start the story, but I don't finish the story because I will ask you to finish this story. Because I, if I tell you the whole story, it's useless. And uh, what I did also, sometimes I send my paintings to a poet to ask him to write his poems about these artworks. Uh, I, I like to see what the people can see in my artwork, especially the well-educated ones, uh, how she can see what I'm doing. And sometimes we did it the other way. I ask the poets to send me their p poems and I paint based on their, on their writings. You know, it's a sort of uh, art exchange, we can call it. Yeah. <clears throat> and anyway, thank you for your coming today. Uh, thanks for this uh, very unique and interesting event. Thanks, Doris, and thanks, Alessandra. Alessandra is here today. <laughs>